So we are continuing on a sermon series looking at the book of Jonah. And I, this morning, was one of those mornings where I realized that I definitely have only been at this church a couple of months because people were asking as they were given little burlap squares, what is this for? And you see, after I'm at a church for a little while, they stop asking (laughs) because they know that if they needed to know, they would have been told. And if not, it's something that is to get them to question to get them to ponder, to have something to, to, to think about and to try to already enter in to what's going to happen in the midst of worship. And so these are tactile items. I, also, I, tr- I, I do not believe that preaching and just using voice is as good as utilizing other ways that our senses can enter into a story, especially one like Jonah. You'll see that this week the whale is gone. You see, the whale... It's only one small portion, one very small portion of the story. And yet, whenever somebody says Jonah, it's Jonah and the whale, Jonah and the whale. And yet, it is, it is a very small portion of the story. A larger portion has to do, actually, with the sailors on the ship. So the ship is still here, but, but uh, we've had that whale exit. So that we can focus on all of what is in this book of Jonah. There is so much more in there than just the whale portion that people tend to remember, that tend to be lifted up, and that's what children talk about. We were just at a trunk or treat, and we took that whale, and we put it in the back of the car, and we had it all decorated up, and people walked by, and as soon as they saw the whale, they said, Jonah, which I kept on thinking, yeah, but Jonah's not the whale. It's so interesting that people see a whale, and they think the book of Jonah. I think my friends, the reason that's the case is because that's, that's easier. That's an easier portion of the story for us to handle, for us to deal with, to tackle. Because this book, this book is really poking at us. It is really f- making us focus on our own walks with God. And actually, it's speaking more to those of us who think we're already right with God and maybe are not following in the ways of Christ, not following God's word as much as maybe we think we do. With that, we'll turn to Jonah. We're we're in the third chapter, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah for a second time. A second time. Remember, The word of the Lord already came to Jonah once, already told him what to do, and he did not listen. He failed to follow the command. And the Lord gives Jonah a second chance. And he says to Jonah, Go to that great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now this actually is actually being pretty clear. Pretty clear. Give to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. You see, Jesus, uh, God had already realized in this case that Jonah uh, doesn't always listen well. And so he said, the message I give you. Okay, you're going in to Nineveh. No freelancing. No saying what you think you should say. Go to the great city of Nineveh. Proclaim to it the message I give you. Now, you would think that he would be all set for this. I mean, he just got swallowed by a whale and and three days later was still alive when he was spit up onto the beach. He was taken towards Nineveh when he was trying to run away. He knows what God did. He knows that God saved him from drowning in the ocean. He knows that he's seen a miracle because not many of us have been in the belly of a great fish for three days and lived to tell about it. So he should be ready, seeing the power of God to go and to proclaim. And, let's be honest, should realize that he failed to listen to God, was failing to follow God, and God gave him another chance. He should be going in there with this heart open to these Ninevites. And yes, they were awful people. They were nasty, and they did horrible things. 
But he was given a second chance, shouldn't they? And that's how we enter into this. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Pretty big city, right? You think about walking through that city. And he's not just going through a portion of it. We see that he does not just say, okay, I've made it to the gates of Nineveh, and I'm just going to yell, and then I'm going back home. We see that he does his due diligence. He walks through the city, going block by block through the streets. And let's, in this case, not so be hard, so hard on Jonah. The Ninevites who killed and brutally slaughtered people, I mean, he had every right to be scared, to be scared about going through this city, and he does walk through it for three days. So let's give him credit there. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. I'm guessing that that was just a portion of the message that Jesus wanted to give, that God wanted to give to them. But, uh, but he really liked that portion. It was easier to say, 40 more days, Nineveh will be overthrown. There's, you don't hear any repentance there. You don't hear, repent, turn around, you still have a chance. God loves you. No. Forty more days, Nineveh will be overthrown, proclaiming street after street after street. Three days. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. So, and I put this on this morning. It was originally going to be a display, and then I realized that somebody had made this to be worn. It was actually already made this way. And while it is uncomfortable to wear because it's itchy and it's sweaty, I figured, well, this is to give you an idea. This is really, you know, they wrapped themselves in these sackcloths, which were just, a, ugh. Uh, and trust me, in these little squares that you cut, when you cut them, little fibers go everywhere, and they, they're itchy and scratchy. There is nothing regal about this. There is nothing where people really wanted to put these sackcloths on, and yet it was a traditional sign. It was a traditional sign throughout the Old Testament. When you hear sackcloth, that means somebody, somebody is repenting is deciding to put themselves in the most uncomfortable position possible and, and, and to come before the Lord and say, Lord, I am as filthy as these rags. I'm as, I'm as thread-worn as these rags. I'm as crumpled as these rags. I'm as irritating and annoying as these rags. And I come before you asking to be changed of heart. I come before you confessing what I have done wrong. You see, the Ninevites believed. Jonah would have never believed that was possible. He had such a terrible view of the Ninevites, and he wasn't alone, that he could, I'm sure, was shocked that they were turning and believing to God because he really believed they were hopeless. We know that from the very beginning. When he went the other way, he believed they were hopeless. And even if they weren't hopeless, he definitely don't want, didn't want them changed because they were evil and they deserved everything to be punished in the most severe ways. And yet, here he comes, proclaiming the word, maybe even half-heartedly, saying the words that God gave him, but not with full gusto, except for the ones he wanted to hear, like the one that we had just before, Nineveh will be overthrown. But they still heard a message from God through him. Fast was proclaimed. Fasting is also a sign of repentance. It's a time of, of taking stuff that is filling our lives and saying we're not going to do that for a portion, so that we might be more fully connected to God. And they put on the sackcloth. Continuing, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, 
he rose from his throne, took off his royal robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This king of Nineveh is the one that sent people to kill, to torture, to maim. He is the one that told the soldiers to give their families the head of their loved ones back and that they were forced to go through the streets with their loved ones on a pole. That is the king that just came before God, took off his royal robes, put on a sackcloth, and sat in the dust. And then this is the proclamation that the king issued to all of Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. So he made it now a proclamation that the whole land was to take a time of fasting, to stop what they were doing. That would include any of the soldiers he had out in the fields that were trying to take over places, that were burning villages, that were going through and and killing people. Everybody, everybody was told to stop what they were doing and to fast. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. The king is going so far to say not just the people, even the animals, we, he realizes how far they have fallen, how awful they have been. And he takes the step of even saying even the animals should be clothed in sackcloth. That they should so change their evil ways that they just needed to take time to not just say they're going to repent, but to sit in this. To sit in this and to think about what they have done. And trust me, as you sit there with the scratchy sackcloth and everything else that is around you that is not good, you start to think of all the not good things that you have done and said. And you begin to realize the repent that you need to do, the harm that you have caused others, to lift that up. And then it continues on. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. So the king ends there saying, who knows? God may yet relent his fierce anger. He might actually have compassion. We may not actually perish if we actually come into alignment, into relationship with God. He had to go on faith that this would happen. And yet he does. He trusts that God is at work, and he's hoping and praying that this is a merciful God, a God that will show compassion to a nation who he just realized how much harm, how much death and destruction they had brought upon the earth. And when God saw what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways. God relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. We serve a merciful God. We serve a merciful God that will not give up on any one of us. And we serve a merciful God that will not give up on anybody who's on your list of people that you hate, despise, treat with disdain. That's the flip side of it. We like to be reminded that God loves us, that when we repent, when we ask forgiveness, that through Christ we are forgiven. But sometimes while we say the words our whole body, the whole way we act, belies the fact that those on our list that we have, we don't really think God will be, should be merciful to them. We don't really want God to save them. A couple of weeks ago, at an administrative council meeting, Pastor Jen led the devotions at the beginning, and she did a wonderful job of that. And she gave out little cards, and she talked about the scriptures and Jesus telling us, to love one another. 
And then she had us write on cards those that we have a hard time loving. And I put it in my pocket when I left the meeting, and as I was preparing for the sermon yesterday, it randomly showed up. And I've got three different names that I wrote on my card. And I know other people took their cards with them. We all have people that it's very hard for us to love. We all have people that we just don't understand. We can't comprehend why they do what they do. And sometimes that gets us to a place of anger, and then sometimes we put them in a little box. We almost treat them as other than. And when God gives us that little nudge to maybe ask for forgiveness, to open our heart to them, how many of us, not, not actually getting on the boat and go the other direction, but really it's the same as the, what is in the story we have here. How many of us run the other direction, flee that direction, go nowhere near the people that God is calling us to love, that God does love? How often do we not think that God could break through and change them and actually bring them into the body of Christ and actually restore them and give them a transformation of heart? That those that were being cruel may now be those that are joyous and loving and kind and caring. Do we actually trust and believe that God has the power that is in the book of Jonah? Do we believe that if we get on our knees and we start praying fervently and we are joined together with brothers and sisters across this globe that God cannot change the hearts of the likes of Vladimir Putin? Or do we just like to sit around and saying that's evil and forget whenever we're pointing there's somebody else. There's four other fingers pointing back at us. And let's face it, without the blood of Christ, we all fall into that trap of falling into evilness, of wickedness, of things that are not from God. We need to constantly be reminded to take time to fast and actually take time to repent, to analyze our lives and to think about it. We have something in the calendar called Ash Wednesday, but that's just once a year. It's a service that not many people go to, but it's a service that talks about the sackcloth, talks about the ashes, talks about repentance, and yet it's during the week, and very few people actually normally come to those services. And it's a powerful one because because we cannot truly love others until we've received the gift of forgiveness from God, until we have repented and we have been brought back into the family. We do not really know how to show that love to others. So my question for you, are you running with God? Are you running with God? Or do you know there's places where you're supposed to be running with God, but you don't. You decide to give in to other things. This morning, everyone was given these because during our time after this where we have the song playing and people can come to the altar rail, I want every one of us to focus on those places where we need a change of heart, where we need to offer up that which we have done that is unholy which is, and is wrong. And for some, for some that's, that can be easier. For some, that can be that they know that they've drank too much or they've eaten too many candy bars or whatever those things are. You know, those are simpler things. But sometimes what we need is that glass in front of us to see that we say we love, we proclaim that God transforms, and yet we do not show love to others we do not reach out in expectation that transformation can and will happen. We sit around and we complain about the news. We complain about drug overdoses or we complain about the way people act and the way people interact with each other. We point our fingers at different groups that we disagree with. How often do we go and do we walk among them sharing God's word? It isn't always repent. It isn't always those ways that would sound horrific. We first need to go and be amongst. You see, the first hard task was not the words that came out of Jonah's mouth. It was actually the action of going and being with the Ninevites. That was the hardest part for him. He had to flee. He wanted to go the other direction. God brought him back so that he would go and be amongst the people of Nineveh. How many of you keep on pointing at people and never have heard their stories? 
people that you grumble about and say, how can they be that way? And yet you never took time to walk among them, to share your love of Jesus with them, to, sh to share about how God has transformed you. That's our call. We have a powerful witness if we're willing to go into places among people that maybe we don't understand. We can't comprehend why they do the things they do. Sometimes it gets to the place that we still don't understand so much that we, we actually have a heart of hate towards them. We may not even admit it, but our words, our actions, as soon as we say a group's name, gets us so rigid and makes us so angry, we know that we have a hardened heart. Right there is our start for repentance. So if you don't have one of those other things, maybe the part that during the song that you're thinking about that you're repenting of is having people that you consider other. There are people that, through your words, actions, and deeds, show that you think they're beyond God's grace. That's not true. God is a gracious God, a merciful God, who rescued the sailors in the ship. Remember, they turned to God. They turned to God easier than Jonah did. And now the Ninevites, hearing their proclamation, these evil Ninevites, they turned and repented back to God. And it's the prophet, the prophet who is, who is sent forth by God to proclaim that is most in need of repentance. Maybe that's us. Maybe that's us this morning. Maybe we think we're running with God, but the hate and vitriol that comes out of us that others see shows that we're not running with God at all and that we need to take our little burlap and be reminded that we don't have it all together but that's okay because God will give us another chance God will give us a chance to proclaim grace and love God will give us a chance to walk among those that others the rest of the society might consider leopards or outcasts we are the ones that are called because we know the power of that love and grace we are the ones to call to extend that message and God is the God who said he would redeem restore bring them back so my friends next week it gets even harder this Jonah story, the parts that we leave out, the, the third and the fourth chapter, this is the one that's supposed to convict us for us to really think about where we are in our walk with God. And it's not easy. But I can promise you that it will be powerful if we allow ourselves this time. I'll also let you know that Sherry has said that we need a healing service. And I agree with you completely. But you know, part of healing, before we can fully receive that healing, we also have to repent. We have to let go of all, all the stuff of this world that has clung to us, that we've taken on, those things that are not from God, those things that are not loving and gracious, and we have to repent and let them go before God can fill us with that healing, before that healing can really be complete and, and enacted completely, we must first make room for that and let go of that, of this world, from Satan. That, that is not good. We have to let it go. We have to repent of it and send it away so that there is room with us for that healing, for that healing to come out through us. And so while this may not seem like a, a kind act that we have to sit here and think about what we repented of, the ultimate story is that we have a compassionate, merciful God. Just as the Ninevites, Ninevites received, that we too can. But first, we actually have to have a change of heart. Let us reflect this morning as the, as the music plays how we can, can, can repent, what we need to let go of, and allow God's love and mercy and grace to enter in. Let it flow over us as we have this time together. I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot O Lamb of God I come I 
Clear.